Okay, well, we're going to turn to the Word of God now. There's going to be a number of uh, readings as I, I go through the evening tonight, and uh, they'll also be up on the screen uh, as we come to them. But in the run-up to Easter, uh, it was in my heart that we should do a series of, of uh, talks on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that great turning point in the history of the world when Jesus died. And uh, so I think this is number four. We had the evidence for the cross, then the purpose of the cross, the power of the cross, and uh, tonight we are thinking about the peace of the cross. Okay. So I'll just pray first of all. So Father, we come to you and we come to your living word and we pray that for us it would be a living word that uh, what we are uh, told in the word itself that it is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword that pierces through the flesh through the bones right to the marrow right to the core of our being lord we pray that that would be the effect of your word for us tonight it would have that powerful impact upon us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we're thinking about the, the, the peace of the cross, it got me thinking, have you, have you ever thought about what this world would be like if it was a peaceful world? A peace between nations. A peace within nations. Could you imagine what the Scottish Parliament or the Houses of Parliament were like if everything was peace? Yeah, some of you are here from Ireland. Could you imagine what the country of Ireland would be like if there was peace? Could you imagine what our families would be like if there was peace? Yeah. And yet, uh, amidst all this world's turmoil, there is a message of peace. And it is found here in the Bible. Yeah. And I suppose that all of the world's turmoil could actually be traced back uh, to a broken relationship. If you really drill down, it's all about a broken relationship between us and the God who made us. Yeah. And the only way that, that peace can be received, really, is when that ro broken relationship between us and God can be restored. Yeah. And that's what the cross is all about. Jesus came and he'd suffered and he died on the cross to restore that broken relationship. And God's heart is for peace instead of hostility and love in place of hatred. Jesus came to establish peace in his new kingdom. I suppose that most of you already know that there is a kingdom that is not of this world. That there is a kingdom that is out of this world, and yet it is very much in this world. It's a kingdom with no geographical boundaries, but it's a kingdom nevertheless. It's a kingdom where Jesus is king. And it, its range is worldwide, and it's made up of every single person who has come to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And it's his kingdom which should really um, be displayed in peace. Yeah. And I've often said to you that when we've gone abro abroad and, and we've gone to churches abroad where we meet people who love Jesus, you know, you've got this relationship with them right away. Yeah. Because there's a real peace there. There's a real... Uh, affinity that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So the message of the gospel is this, that God himself has reached out with a plan. And it's called the gospel message, the good news that he's got for us. And it's to save us out of this evil world and invite us into the kingdom of his son, Jesus. Now, God, of course, has set a very high standard for peace. And the good news tonight is that his high standard has been met. 
So we're going to read our first reading now, and it's from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. And we're only going to read four verses from 19 to 23. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope of the gospel. Well, it's our sin and our rebellion that has caused our hostility uh, with God and our separation from God. But God's character and, and His presence is one of holiness, absolute purity, yeah? The highest possible standard of moral perfection is found in God. And His justice demands that it stays that way. And yet, how can that be done? How can we who are so sinful be reconciled with God? And the word reconciliation is here. And, and the word of reconciliation just means to have peace with. How can we have peace with God when we are such sinful people? And yet, we are told in these verses that through Jesus, God has reconciled to himself all things by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. And the simple reality is this, and the wonder of it all is, that peace has been made between man and God through what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. And uh, on that cross, Jesus Christ, in, in all of his agony, and all of the shamefulness of the cross, all of the pain, all of the suffering, and then in the three hours of darkness, all of the, the demonic stuff that came on him, all the judgment of God that came upon him for our sins, was where Jesus paid the price. Yeah. And aren't you so thankful tonight that on the cross, Jesus bore our sin? Yeah. At Easter time, we sometimes sing the song, There is no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He alone could open the gate of heaven and let us in. Yeah. Jesus is the only one who is worthy to have taken our place and borne our judgment that would satisfy a God that is holy, a God that we are at enmity with, that we are enemies of. And God is satisfied by what happened to his own son on the cross. And Jesus willingly went there that he might take our place. And above the cross is great big letters, L-O-V-E. Yeah. I, I hope we don't come away thinking about the cross and thinking how cruel God was in allowing his son to be treated like that. I want us to come away thinking how loving God is allowing his son to be treated like that, that we might be saved, that we might be forgiven, that we might be rescued, that we might be taken out of this horrible world and, and ushered into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God gave his perfect spotless son to die on a cross, and it had been planned for centuries, even eternity past. And we're going to think about that as we break bread later on tonight. Now we're going to read again from the book of Ephesians. And it's in chapter 2.
verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Okay? He himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So there we've got the words peace and reconciliation in uh, that passage once again. It's talking here about peace between mankind and God, but it's also talking about peace between uh, two different peoples. And it's the peace between Jews and the rest of the nations of the world, which are the Gentile nations. And as you probably know, Jews thought that they were the people of God and the only people of God and everybody else was lost. But God says, no. I want everyone to have the opportunity to know me, to experience me, yeah, to love me, to have a hope and to have a future, not just the Jews. yeah. And so Jesus came into the world so that there might be this uniting between Jew and Gentile. And in the gospel, there is revealed this wonderful plan that God has that no matter who we are, what nationality we are, what religious background that we have, you know, how rich we are or how poor we are, there is a way that we can know God. And it's not through what we have done. And it's not through what I am or what you are that we can merit knowing God. It's what Christ has done on the cross. Yeah. And Jesus, remember, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. What does God ask us to do in turn? He asks us to accept that, to receive the gift that he wants to give to us, the gift of his salvation. It's a free gift. We don't pay anything. Just God wants to reach out and bless us. Bring us into relationship with him. Give us his Holy Spirit that he might live in our hearts. Give us a hope and a future that is for much more than just our lifetime here on earth, whether it's 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, or even 100 years. It's for eternity. And it's much better. Some of our songs we sing, there is no more pain. There is no more suffering. There is no more dying when we get to glory. Yeah. The best has yet to come. So at the cross, God is at peace with mankind. But through the cross, this is the other aspect of the peace of the cross, we can know peace in our own hearts. And that's something that is huge, I think. Having peace in your heart, having peace in my heart, in every single situation of life. Is that you? <laughs> is it you? Is it me? Experiencing peace in every circumstance of our lives. Well, let's read John's Gospel now. Chapter 14. And uh, this is the Lord Jesus. He's speaking here. And you probably remember, if you know anything about this uh, part of John's Gospel, that it's at the end of Jesus' three years of ministry. And uh, he's now with his disciples in Jerusalem. They have gone to this upper room where he spends time with them. And 
Uh, this section is called his upper room ministry, his final teaching to his disciples, knowing that he, just in a matter of hours, is going to be taken and nailed to the cross. Okay? And here's what he says to them in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Now in verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I like to call this Jesus out of this world peace. <laughs> he says, this is peace that I give to you that you won't find in this world anywhere. It's the peace that God plants into our hearts in every situation if we allow him to. If we trust him to. Yeah? I see this as being real and very practical. Uh, and I'm speaking to a group of you who, who know Jesus, um, and many of you have known him for, for many years. But can we honestly say that in the circumstances of life, we have peace? Well, I believe that's what Jesus wants us to have, what he wants us to experience. No matter how bad things are, it's easy to be peaceful when things are going well, isn't it? really easy. But what about things like when your, your health deteriorates? When you lose your job? When you run out of money? You know, when there's, when there's trouble in the family? You know, and, and I could go on and on and on. We have peace then. I believe that Jesus wants us to know peace in every single situation. And so he says to his followers, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You know, I would be telling you a lie if I could put up my hand and say that I've been peaceful in every situation in life. Um, but I think I've learned as I've grown older and possibly knowing Jesus more, to be more peaceful in every situation. Yeah. To know that God has got me right here in his hand, because that's where he's got me. And that's where he's got you, you know. You know, I, I think I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, when I, when I fell in Norway, and uh, I, I, I had peace really all through that, Terrible situation. We might differ, but I did feel at peace. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 I knew that God had me in His hand, particularly when an ambulance turns up in the middle of nowhere in three minutes. I just knew that God had me in His hand, and all through that experience, He was with me. Um, and it's a real thing. It's a tangible thing. This is not airy-fairy, fanciful thinking. Jesus said it, so it must be true. Just ask us to trust him. Yeah. And to remind us, Jesus says in this passage that when he, when he is gone, he would send the Holy Spirit, who not only would be with us, but he would be in us. Yeah? Now, that's something that's pretty tough to comprehend, but it's true. God's Spirit is in us. And what does he do when he's in us? He gives us his special peace in verse number 27. And so Jesus' peace is real peace for every circumstance in life. 
And if you just want to to think about that, remember that Jesus went through great troubles in his life. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us that we've got a high priest and there isn't Jesus who can sympathize with us because he has been in the circumstances that we are likely to face in all of our lives. He experienced opposition. He experienced distrust from his family. Uh, he, he, he experienced mocking, rejection from the people that he had come to save. Yeah. He experienced rejection from some of his own disciples. And he, on the cross, he experienced a, a, a crowd of people who were laughing at him as he was hanging there. Thieves on either side who were mocking him. But ultimately, one of them came to put his trust in the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Jesus knew what it was like. He knew what suffering, he knew what illness was like. Because he had encountered so many people with desperate illnesses. Mental and physical. And he'd been able to give them a touch from heaven. And heal them and give them hope. Yeah. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do you remember that elsewhere the Lord Jesus said, you know, don't worry. Don't be anxious about anything. About what you're going to eat. About what you're going to wear. Yeah. Don't worry. Jesus said, take a look around you. Look at the fields. <clears throat> look at the flowers. Look at these wild flowers and all their wonderful color. Who is clothed then? God hand. Take a look at the birds in the air. Take a look at the animals in the sea, the fish and the mammals. Who takes care of them? God does. Yeah. And if he can do that, he can take care of you and me. Yeah. Part of our problem today is that we're pretty self-sufficient, aren't we? It's not very often that we could say that we really have to trust God because our backs are to the wall. We have nowhere else to turn. Yeah. But when we have nowhere else to turn, and we turn to God and we trust in Him, how often does He show up? Yeah. Think of circumstances in our lives where God has showed up when we had nowhere else to turn except to Him. So, Jesus' peace is a real peace. Can we lose our peace? What do you think? Can we lose the peace that God gives? Yeah, that's right. We can lose the peace if we lack faith. We can lose peace through sin in our lives. And how do we get it back? Through repentance and confession. Isn't God wonderful? If we lose our peace, he doesn't say, well, you can't have it again. <laughs> he's not like that. He's not stingy. He's not mean. He wants the best for us. Yeah. And so he wants us to experience peace in this very troubled world in which we live. We are surrounded by people who are fearful, who are anxious about tomorrow, yeah, who have no hope. And God has given us a hope and he's given us a peace not to hold to ourselves, as we're going to find out just in a minute or two. But if we think about the peace that, um, that the Lord Jesus can give, 
I, I wanted just to remind you of a story that I think is in the, the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's about a day that Jesus stepped out of a boat and was in the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Very beautiful spot. And as he was walking through that district, he encountered a man. Now, this was no ordinary man. If we were to encounter him tonight, we would say this guy was totally crazy. And you weren't able to go near to him because your life was in danger. If you went near to him, he was called demoniac. And uh, people had tried to tame him like an animal and put chains round him, bound his arms and his legs. And he managed to escape out of his chains. He could not be bound. He, w he had to live out and out of the town and live in caves. And he would shout and he would cry. He was totally crazy. And then one day, Jesus Christ came along. I don't know whether he knew it was Jesus or not. I have, I have no evidence to show that he would have known who Jesus was before that day. But when he saw Jesus, he came out of the cave and he came running up to Jesus. And here's what he does. He runs up to him and he doesn't attack him. He falls down on his knees and in front of Jesus and he cries out, What do you want me, Jesus, Son of God, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. In fact, it tells us that he, he shouted it out. Cried out to Jesus. What do you want with me? Why are you here? And Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Jesus recognized, of course, because he knows everything, that at the root of this man's problem was that he was demon-possessed. Okay? And so Jesus says, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked the man, What is your name? And the man says, My name is Legion for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. <clears throat> now, legion represented a large number. If there was a legion of Roman soldiers, I think that was the, the, the largest grouping that you could have of soldiers, and there would be something between 2,000, 3,000 uh, men in that group. Yeah? So, when this man is called Legion, we immediately discover there's a bit of a problem here. <laughs> this is a complicated case, yeah? For any of you who have been involved in ministry, yeah? <laughs> you, you'll have come across complicated cases sometimes. I've, I've never seen or heard of a case like this one, where actually the man was inhabited by thousands of demons. Is there any wonder that he was crazy? Is there any wonder that he was out of his mind? Is there any wonder that he shouted and screamed and probably, you know, tore at walls with his nails? Maybe even had to eat the grass of the field. I do not know. But this guy was crazy. He was unapproachable. Yeah? He could not be tamed. But when he came to Jesus, he fell down at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. What do you want with me? Maybe he thought that Jesus was going to come and destroy him. You know? I think he probably knew that that he was just totally evil. His life wasn't worth living. And was this man whom he saw and recognized to be somebody special, 
Was he going to come and finally put him out of his misery? I don't know. But anyway, Jesus had the answer. Yeah. And Jesus sent the demons out of this man. And in the hillside, there was a herd of pigs. 2,000 pigs in total. And that day, these pigs get the fright of their lives. Because every single one of them became demon-possessed. And I suspect there must have been a lot of noise. Have you ever heard pigs squealing? Well, can you imagine 2,000 pigs squealing, racing down the hill and running straight into the lake? And they were drowned. Don't ever think that Satan has no power. Satan has great power. And Satan's whole passion is to seek to kill and to destroy people's lives. And he's being very effective at that, I judge. Very effective. I've seen how much destruction that can happen. I've seen the destruction of drink. I've seen the destruction of drugs. I've seen the destruction of, of selfishness, the misuse of power. All around us we see the power of Satan at work. Yeah. And Jesus came to set us free from the power of Satan. No matter how much control he has had on our lives in the past. Right? And how do I know that? Well, because after this event, after the shrieking, the noise must have gone into the town because everybody started to come out of the town to see what was going on, right? And then they discovered to their horror that the pigs had gone into the sea, right? Because this was their livelihood for many of them. And they were now in the sea, they were drowned. But what else did they see? They saw the demoniac sitting at his in his at his feet at the feet of Jesus, in his right mind, no longer naked, he's got clothes on. Yeah. He's at peace. For the first time for many years in his life, he is at peace because Jesus has set him free. It's the peace of the cross. Jesus came to give us peace. Well, this guy, he wanted to go and follow Jesus. Jesus says, no, stay at home. The people in the, in the town said, go away, Jesus. Will you? <laughs> Please go away. You've done enough trouble and destruction here. We don't want to have you around anymore. But here's what Jesus does. He says to the man, go back into the town and tell the people everything that I have done for you. Yeah. Tell them that you've got peace. Yeah. And that's what he did. The peace of the cross. Jesus gives peace. I hope you know it. I hope you want to experience that for yourself. That's what should make us stand out, is our love and the peace that God gives to us in our lives. There's one final thing that I want just to say. Because the peace of the cross is life-changing. So we're going to the book of 2 Corinthians. Reading from verse 16. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So Paul is really writing here and saying, you know, I, I don't see things from a worldly perspective anymore. I'm writing to you 
from the, res- the perspective of heaven and the perspective of God. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in, <coughs> is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. God wants to make us new, and he can make us new through faith in Jesus. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And this is the part I want to focus on now. We have been reconciled through faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ has now given to us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, or or to be a sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so on the cross, Jesus took our sins. When we put our trust in Jesus, Jesus' righteousness is perfection, is credited to us, and God just sees us like a whole bunch of Jesuses, right? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And it's through the message of the cross that has brought two groups together, God, who is holy, and mankind, who is sinful, yeah, at odds with one another. And through what God has planned and God has done, He is able to bring us together. He reconciles us by the cross. And now he has given to us this message of reconciliation. So the message is, you get it and then you pass it on. Okay? That's what the disciples of Jesus do. They pass it on. We become ambassadors for Christ. For about 30 years... I worked in the the pharmaceutical industry, and I I was a a representative for major pharmaceutical companies who developed and manufactured uh, drugs for veterinary practices for use in all types of animals. And my job was to be an ambassador for the company that I represented, represented. And so, with all my heart, I tried to be a good ambassador for the company that I worked for and ultimately paid me to work for them. I wanted to be the best I possibly could be for them. And I wanted to to, um, share the message of these products, and and they were world-leading products, many of them. It was just hugely exciting to work for for these companies and uh, to be able to tell uh, farmers and vets uh, about uh, products that that could really make a difference in their operations, whether it's your pet's life or whether it was the livestock in your farm, whether it was chickens and hens or whether it was cattle, uh, sheep, goats, you know, or horses, no matter what it was, we had really important products that could make all the difference. Yeah. And so I, I could get quite excited to tell people about these products, particularly when a new one came out. You know, you say, I've got something good for you today. (laughs) And then you told them the price. (laughs) But you know, we have got such a message that should excite us enough to be able to say to people, I've got some really good news to tell you today. And you know the best bit? It's free. It costs you nothing. Wouldn't you want to be an ambassador carrying that kind of message. And that's what God says to you and me. You know, peace has been made at the cross. The gospel is a message of peace. Be at peace in yourself. Be peacemakers and carry the message of peace and reconciliation between man and God to people all around us who are yet That's my challenge to you tonight. 
First of all, to experience the peace of Christ. Really experience it for yourself. Hold each other accountable for that. Yeah? But also to challenge you, knowing the peace of Christ, passing it on to others, showing You know, what is it about you guys? You're so different. You know, all this stuff's going on in the world. You know, and now we've got COVID. And he said, you, you don't seem to be worried about it. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> yeah, because I trust in someone who's going to take care of me, no matter the circumstances in my life. Anyway, we're going to stop there. Yeah, we're going to pray. And then we'll celebrate communion together. Father, we thank you. We thank you tonight for not only the, your word and the truth of your word, but we thank you that, that your word can be experienced in our hearts and in our lives. And we thank you that the peace that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to those of us who, who trust in you, who have received you as our personal Savior, we thank you that that peace that you pour into our hearts is an out-of-this-world peace. It doesn't make sense to the natural person. But to us who know you, it makes absolute sense. What a wonderful God that you are. We thank you so much that your heart has been to rescue mankind out of this troubled world and out of our sin and bring us to yourself the greatest dad that it's possible to know. And to know the Lord Jesus personally, the greatest friend that it is possible to know. Lord, we pray that would be the desire of all of our hearts, to know Jesus as our Savior and our friend, to invite him to have residence in our hearts as Lord of our life, and then to pass him on to people all around us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.